okay guys so so welcome to the to our inspiring lecture series right so it's really a great pleasure to actually see Cesar after so many years right so Cesar, I think the last time I we actually met in person was in Zaragoza for Netsai but I may be wrong uh, but I remember having this beer uh, with you in one of the squares that actually looked like the square behind you in a sense uh, but it was a, a quite pleasant time so I met Cesar, and this is for everybody, in 2009, actually, when I was doing my sabbatical um, with Lasso Barabashi. And to be honest, uh, we had very nice discussions uh, there, although at the time he was at Harvard already. So when I came, he, he had just left. But it was clear then, uh, I guess, that uh, as you see, that uh, Cesar was destined for great things, right? And after so many years, I'm happy to actually find both of us actually now in Europe. Um, he actually, in 2009, I invited Cesar to be a keynote speaker of a conference that, uh, that we started called Complinet. And uh, it, at actually that invitation demonstrated to me the character that he is as a person, right? So Cesar, I'm sure you remember that he flew there, gave his talk. We went to see a football match. Uh, <laughs> and then you flew back, I guess, on that evening, straight back. Um, while I think someone else would actually at that point just cancel and say, sorry, I cannot fly because it's too tight. Um, in fact, I don't know if you know, but you're probably one of the few speakers that have been to Compranet twice. We try to avoid repeating speakers, but I think you give such nice talks that we wanted to have you again. So uh, both times, as you guys are going to see, colleagues, that uh, uh, Cesar wowed us uh, on his style of presentation. He's one of the it's not because I know him, but he's one of the few people that uh, not only he's not only a good presenter, but he's an amazing researcher as well. So if you've been living in your cage and haven't heard of him, so I'm just going to take a little bit of his bio here. So he's a, a Chilean Spanish American scholar uh, known for his contributions in economic complexity, data visualization and applied artificial intelligence. Uh, he currently leads the Center for Collective Learning um, at the University of Toulouse. He's an honorary professor at the University of Manchester and also a visiting professor at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So until 2019, actually Cesar was at MIT uh, and he led the collective learning group. Um, and prior to working at MIT, he was a research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, he's the founder and I think the CEO, if I'm not mistaken, of Data Wheel, which is a, an award-winning company specialized on the creation of data distribution and visualization, holds his PhD from the University of Notre Dame and a bachelor from the University Universidad Católica de Chile. So his contributions have been uh, recognized uh, by him receiving many awards, including the Lagrange Prize, three Webby Awards, and he's the author of three books. Uh, one uh, that he has just came out is you can actually read it for free if you. Uh, do not want to wait for the release of, I guess, of the copy. It's on his website. It's called How Humans Judge Machines. Um, it's forthcoming. It says forthcoming your website says that 2020, but I think it's probably now we can say that is, I don't know if it's out yet. You can probably say this later. That might be the subject of your talk. Um, uh, says a really nice to see you again. Really great pleasure of being here. Um, the, the floor is, is yours, the virtual floor. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Ronaldo. After that introduction, I, I can only disappoint. <laughs> so it's, it's my pleasure to be here. I've, I've also enjoyed, you know, many times, you know, uh, sharing with, with Ronaldo. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, you know, share, you know, uh, my latest book, which is How Humans Judge Machines. So I'll just do the traditional ask, you know, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I want to go into presentation mode, and this book um, was a little bit of a departure from my previous research. You know, uh, I was at the Media Lab uh, throughout uh, most of last decade, and I remember, like on, on 2015, 2016, as, as AI was starting to become a hot topic again. You know, there were currents of people looking at AI and society, and you know, some of these currents, you know, were were quite critical. But one thing that, to me, as a scientist, was missing from that work was people that was trying to understand how people judge these AI mistakes in comparison to humans that did the same mistakes, okay? Uh, and I didn't see those counterfactuals. And, and to me, those counterfactuals seem to be important because at the end of the day, uh, if we're judging something, we wanna know if we're judging fair or not. 
Uh, so uh, at that time, I, I had two postdocs in my group that were social psychologists. These are people that are experienced, you know, running, you know, experiments that help people understand, you know, uh, how, you know, single factors can affect, you know, people's, you know, perception or opinion about something. So we decided to work together uh, in the creation of like a large experiment, larger than what we could fit on a paper uh, that resulted in this book. Uh, so this is a book that has more than 80 experiments that compares people's reactions to human and machine actions across a variety of scenarios. And there is a motivation for this work that is relatively simple, which is the following, which is that AI is changing the world. AI is changing the way that we collect natural resources, like we see in this autonomous vehicle, the way in which we manage our agriculture, like we see in this case of robotics. And it is also you know, changing the way that we organize logistics. It is changing the way that we um, provide services. And it's even the change in the way in which we fight war. But AI is not only changing the world through you know, machines that are tangible. A lot of the AI that we see today is embodied in software, whether it is you know, Twitter bots or whether it is software, for instance, in human resources that are helping screen candidates or university admission systems. It is also being used in the legal realm, you know, where there are huge backlogs of cases that are also being processed you know, using artificial intelligence methods. And the question that I want to ask today, well, you know, I don't think AI is here to replace humans. I think AI is here to become a member of our society. And if it's going to become a member of our society, we need to understand what place uh, uh, it, it should belong. You know? and, uh, to, to do that properly, we need to first understand also, you know, whether, you know, we are engaging with it in the right way. So when we look at artificial intelligence, do we think of it as friend or foe? How do we judge machines? And that's what we're going to try to explore here using a variety of scenarios that are going to help us first start seeing, you know, a few specific differences and later look at certain regularities or statistical principles that help explain these differences across a wide variety of cases. And the reason why we want to do this is because machines can make mistakes and they can encode biases. Okay? But the thing is that humans can also make mistakes and can encode biases. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question that we're going to ask is, well, if a human and a machine make the same mistake, do they get the same reaction? You know? Or do we react differently to the mistakes of humans and machines? So the book is organized in a number of chapters that explore this. The first chapters are more introductory. They discuss basic concepts of moral philosophy and moral psychology. And then from there, you know, we introduce experimental methods. And as the book starts moving along in chapters three, four, and five, we, we enter thematic chapters that look at you know, AI in the context of fairness, privacy, labor displacement. Then in chapter six, we're going to put all of this together. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to go briefly to some of these chapters. So the book is, is relatively large. It's available for free for anyone to read at judgingmachines.com. And it is also you know, a, on print starting February 2nd with MIT Press. You know? And I'm going to like, pick a few examples here of the experiments that we run. Now, when I'm talking about experiments, what type of experiments am I talking about? And what we're doing here is- okay, everybody. Yes? Yeah. Sorry, there was a question or? Okay. Um, so when we're talking about experiments, what are we talking about? And we're talking about randomized experiments. These are experiments in which we assign people randomly to two groups, you know? So people come to our website, in this case, this Amazon Mechanical Turk, you know? And they uh, decide to participate of our task. And when they participate of our task, we flip a coin and we randomly assign them to one group or the other. One group is only going to see a scenarios involving actions of humans. And the other group is only going to see a scenarios involving actions of machines. So the people that participate of this experiment, they don't know that they're part of an experiment that's comparing humans and machines. You know, They're just answering questions of machines or just answering questions about humans. And, and this is a very good design because basically, you know, since these groups are balanced, you know, the probability that someone, uh, let's say, that hates machines has the same probability when they're on one side or the other side, you know, of the experiment. You know, we can then collect the statistics on how people react to these scenarios and interpret those statistics only in the context of how people's reactions change when we change the scenario from the action of a machine to the action of a human. 
And uh, this was a relatively large effort. You know, we did many batches of experiments. Uh, around 6,000 people participated in total. And for each experiment, we had more or less like 200 people on each side, you know? Uh, so this allows us to, to have a relatively good statistical power for experiments of this type. Now, how do these scenarios look like? Well, these scenarios involve, you know, uh, situations that could be described as the action of a machine or the action of a human, and they have to be credible as the action of a machine. And that was a bit of a challenge. So it took us about six to eight months to come out with all of these scenarios. But here is an example. An excavator is digging up a site for a new building. Unbeknownst to the driver, the site contains a grave. The driver does not notice the grave and digs through it. Later, human remains are found. So this is a scenario that could very well be the action of a machine or the action of a human. And we want to try to see if people judge this scenario differently when the excavator was autonomous or when the excavator was operated by a human drive. You know? Uh, now, before we get to that, you know, we have to introduce some basic concepts of moral psychology. The first one is the moral foundational theory, you know, that uh, was proposed by Jonathan Haidt and others. This is a, you know, very popular way to understand, you know, moral psychology today. And this is the idea that when we make moral judgments, you know, we don't just are judging things as, as good or bad, but we're doing it across certain dimensions that are kind of like some sort of eigenvectors, you know, if, if you may, you know, of morality. Uh, because we make moral judgments about situations that involve harm or care, or situations that are, are fair, or situations that involve a breach of loyalty or authority, or that violate, you know, a dimension called purity and sanctity, you know? So when we uh, look at a scenario, we can decompose a scenario into one of these five dimensions. How do we do that? We run a separate data collection exercise in which we give people a scenario like this excavator scenario, and we give people like a bag of words in random order that comes from these five groups. So for example, if people associate an, a scenario with the word indecent or obscene, we say, well, that scenario is triggering the moral dimension of purity. But if people say this is harmful, then it associates the moral dimension of harm. In the case of the excavator scenario, this is a scenario that triggers the moral dimension of purity. You know, if you dig up a grave, nobody is hurt. You know, uh, also, if you dig up a grave, you're not doing something that is unfair or, you know, unloyal, but there is something sacred about the human body. You know, you would have said like, you know, it digged up a refrigerator, there wouldn't have been anything weird or immoral in this scenario. There's something sacred about a human body, even if it's a remain, you know, that has long been buried there, you know, and that's why it triggers that moral dimension of purity. And we can capture the moral dimension associated to each scenario using this separate data collection exercise. The other thing that we need to um, understand is the role of intention you know, in moral judgment. And, and this is something that is very important. It's, it's the basis of criminal law, actually. And to illustrate the importance of intention in moral judgment, I'm going to use two scenarios. So in the first scenario, we have Alice and Bob. There are two colleagues in a software company who are competing for a promotion at work. Alice has a severe peanut allergy, and, no, and Bob knows about this. So he sneaks into the office kitchen, mixes peanut butter into Alice's soup. At lunchtime, Alice accidentally drops her soup on the floor, and she decides to go out for lunch, so she suffers no harm. So in this scenario, in this scenario A, Bob knows that Alice is allergic, tries to poison her, you know, but Alice suffers no harm because she accidentally drops her soup. Okay, so there is intention to produce harm, but there is no harm. The scenario B is very similar, you know, but in this scenario, you know, Bob doesn't know about Alice's peanut butter allergy, gives her a sandwich, you know, trying to be nice. Alice eats some of the sandwich and actually she suffers a severe allergic reaction and she has to be taken to the hospital. So in a scenario B, you know, there is harm, but there is no intention, you know. So when we look at that, you know, we can, you know, uh, think uh, first, you know, that in the first scenario, there is kind of like almost like an attempted murder or, or, or the attempt to be do harm. And it's something that would be wrong. But in a scenario B, you know, basically, you know, there is harm, but since there is no intention, maybe it's not as wrong, you know, as a scenario A, you know? So intention plays a, an important role when we're thinking about morality. It's not just about the moral dimensions, you know, that a scenario involves. Now, we're going to be talking about humans and machines. Can we think about intentions in machines? And that is something that, you know, a lot of people get confused with. So 
Uh, I'm going to use here like uh, also an example to illustrate how we can think about intention in the case of machines, you know, because uh, for the most part, we have an intuition that they expect machines to be obedient, to not have kind of like an ability to uh, have uh, something similar to intention or agency. But I think that's true for machines without the ability to learn. But when machines have the ability to learn, you know, which is what differentiates AI from like a cookie cutting machine at a factory, you know, like there is something that starts to behave a little bit similar to intention that it starts to emerge. So think of a self-driving car, you know, that on the one hand is designed to protect the driver at all costs and compare that to a self-driving car that is designed to protect a pedestrian at all costs. Now, you know, those cars encounter a, a, a tree that has just fallen into the street because of some heavy winds and in a maneuver, you know, they injure, you know, someone. The car that is designed to protect the driver at all costs might swerve and injure a pedestrian because it's trying to protect the driver. The car that is designed to protect the pedestrian at all costs might crash against the wall to save a pedestrian and therefore injuring the driver. So the car, of course, doesn't have an agency like a human has. It's not saying like, I am trying to do this, but it has a goal. And you know, machine learning in, in the context of trying to satisfy goals needs to choose sometimes you know, which action is going to do. And, 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 and machine learning is known to come up sometimes with even weird solutions. So the car is not uh, having intention as human has, but a car that is designed to protect pedestrians at all costs might injure the driver because it is intended to protect pedestrians. And a car that is you know, trying to save the driver might injure a pedestrian because it's intending to you know, save the driver, you know, is trying to satisfy that objective function. So in that context, you know, I would say you know, machines with the ability to learn, machines with the ability to sort of you know, through experience figure out what solution to choose in pursuit of a goal, don't have a level of agency like humans have, but they're also not you know, at the level of agency of a cookie cutting machine or a toaster, you know, uh, that have no agency, no ability to, to, to choose solutions, you know, in the context of an objective function or a goal. You know, there's somewhere in between, and we can think of intention as some sort of continuum that grows with the ability to learn, with the ability to decide, which is at the end, you know, what machine learning is about. Now, uh, if we start formalizing this, we can think, you know, of you know the peanut butter allergy example and that examples that, that that we saw in the context of a function, a function that tries to predict the level of wrongness W here as a function of the moral dimensions, you know, harm, fairness, loyalty, authority, purity, intention, you know, and the characteristics of the subject that performs the action and of the subject that receives the action, you know, like Alice and Bob in this case, you know. Uh, so you can think, for example, if you do this as a function of harm and intention, this moral space uh, would tell us that, uh, or we should expect, you know, this hypothesis that in a case of low intention and high harm, for instance, when Bob accidentally gives the sandwich to Alice, you know, we would rate that as not very wrong. But there was a lot of intention to produce harm and little harm, we can rate that as something that is very wrong. So we can think of now, you know, uh, uh, of morality using, you know, a mathematical representation by leveraging these ideas from moral psychology and moral philosophy. So uh, this helps us formalize our experiment because basically what we're doing is a randomized experiment in which we assign people to a treatment condition in which the action is performed by a machine, a control condition where the action is performed by a human. We have them look at the same mistake and we're going to ask, well, do we get the same reaction, you know? And how do we know if you get the same reaction? Well, we're going to try to map up this function f of h for humans or f of m for machines. Now, uh, what do we use to map this function? Then in reaction to one of these scenarios, we ask people, you know, was the action harmful? Would you hire this driver for a similar position? Was the action intentional? Do you like the driver? How morally wrong or right was the driver's action? Do you agree that the driver should be promoted to a position with more responsibility? Do you agree that the driver should be replaced with a robot or an algorithm? So replaced by the different type, a machine replaced by human or a human replaced by machine. Do you agree that the driver should be replaced by another person or a machine replaced by another machine? Do you think the driver is responsible for unearthing the grave 
And if you were in a similar situation, would you have done the same? So people reacted to these scenarios using this list of 11 questions. And here's what we find in the case of the excavator scenario. So for instance, you know, when it comes to the moral dimension of harm, they don't assign too much harm. It's kind of like more in the middle of the scale, but they assign significantly more harm when this is the action of a machine than a human. You know, when we ask, would you hire, you know, this machine again, or would you hire this driver again? People would hire again the human driver, but they're not so uh, willing to hire the machine again. When we look at intention here, you know, this, the, the difference is not big enough for, for, for us to call it significant. You know, like usually we, we tend to have p-values that are much larger when we have big gaps. And they tend to kind of like see this as accidental uh, for the machine and the human. You know? uh, when we ask people, you know, well, do you like the driver? They like more the human driver. They find the action of the human driver as more morally correct and so forth. And people are more likely to think that they would have done the same in a similar situation when we present this as the problem uh, caused by a human instead of a machine. So, you know, it would tell them that a machine did this, people think, oh, I wouldn't have made the same mistake. It would tell them that a human did this, people think that they would have done the same mistake. Of course, the mistake is the same, you know? So we start seeing that we don't judge humans and machines differently. We do make differences. So now let's get into the scenarios, you know? So the first scenario that I'm gonna present is a trio of three scenarios, you know, uh, that are three different possible outcomes to the same setup. A large tsunami is approaching a coastal town of 10,000 people with potentially devastating consequences. The politician or algorithm responsible for the safety of the town can decide to evacuate everyone with a 50% chance of success or save 50% of the town with 100% success. Okay. So this is a scenario that involves the moral dimension of harm. Uh, but also the moral dimension of fairness because you have to choose you know who to save or not and we have three possible outcomes the first one is the one in which the politician or algorithm decides to save everyone but the rescue effort fails the town is devastated and a large number of people die the second one is when the politician or algorithm decides to save everyone and the rescue effort succeeds everyone is saved and the last one is where the politician or algorithm decides to take a compromise and save 50 percent of the town so here we have six different groups of people, yes? Because we have two conditions, you know, like, like the machine and the human, and we have three possible outcomes. So we have to run this in all of these six different batches. And what we find is the following. First, let's look at, you know, a, a scenario four when we take the compromise. And here for the most part, people don't see a difference. You know, they, they rate the action it's the same in levels of harm, would you hire? They give more intention to the human, you know, but um, for the most part, they make few differences, except for this replace different dimension. They really want to replace the machine by a human, you know, they don't want to replace the human by a machine in that case, but that is something that in general, it's always the case, you know, machines always get canned, even when they get it right. So let's look at the case in which you try to save everyone and succeed. And when you try to save everyone and succeed, you start seeing more differences here. So of course, this is a positive outcome. You try to save 100% of the town and you save 100% of the town. But when the human does it, you know, uh, it gets a lot of credit. The machine is evaluated positively, but it's taken a little bit more for granted. You know, when most people, would you hire the machine? Was the action intentional? They, they see the action of the human very intentional, that of the machine, not that much. Uh, do you like, you know, the human? Do you like the machine? They like the human much more. They find the action of the human more morally correct. Still though, they would like to replace the machine by a human, even when the machine gets it right more than, and they wouldn't want to replace a human that gets it right for a machine. Now let's look when you try to save everyone and fail, you know, and here we see big, big differences, you know. Uh, first of all, people find the action of the machine more harmful. You know, significantly more harmful. They want to hire, you know, the politician that failed. They don't want to rehire the machine that failed, you know, like the 0.5 is right here. So the human kind of like gets reelected, the machine, you know, loses by a landslide. You know, in terms of intention, you know, even though when, when, when the machine uh, and the human got it right, people saw big difference in intention. When the machine and the human got it wrong, the difference in intention is much smaller, you know? Uh, would you, do you like the human? People like the human, they dislike, you know, the machine, they find the action of the human to be more morally correct, they promote the human and whatnot, you know? So in, in, in some ways, you know, like we're starting to see some differences in which, you know, 
when the a human or machine gets it right, the human gets taken for, uh, the, the human gets credit and the machine gets taken for granted. And when the human or machine uh, gets it wrong here, the human is evaluated relatively positively. You know, you see that they, they like the human, they find it more morally correct, you know, and, and so forth, because the human kind of like try to do the right thing. And the machine is evaluated negatively because it got into the wrong outcome. And as we're going to see later, that's a pattern that it's quite universal across, you know, the scenarios that we're going to see. Now let's look at a couple of self-driving car scenarios. On a sunny spring day, a driver or driverless car working for a supermarket chain accidentally runs over a pedestrian who runs in front of the vehicle. The pedestrian is hurt and taken to the hospital. We can do the same scenario, you know, with a dog, and we do a similar scenario in a cold and windy day, you know, where a driver or driverless car working for a supermarket chain tries to avoid a falling tree and also injures a pedestrian on the sidewalk. You know, what do we find here? Well, you know, once again, we find that people find the action of the machine always in red, you know, uh, as more harmful. You know, they like the human more, you know, they want to replace the machine. But what I want to focus here is the intentional dimension, you know. Here, people actually assign significantly less intention to the human than to the machine, you know? And this may sound counterintuitive, but what we're observing here is that people are willing to completely forgive a human, you know? If you, if you were involved in something that is clearly an accident and you're a human, it's like, it's not your fault. You shouldn't be worried about it. But if you were a machine in the same situation, you are not that lucky. You still have kind of like some sort of residual responsibility that they assign you, you know, and that gets expressed on, on this intention dimension and also on this responsible dimension down here. Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we find here an example in which, you know, people actually assign more intention, even if it's on the lower end of the scale to a machine than to a human. Now, you know, machines are not doing well, you know, uh, in, in our experiment so far. So we might ask, is this all that is there is to this, you know? Do people always reject machines, you know? You know, like there is this phenomenon in psychology known as algorithm aversion, you know? People basically avoid machines when they see them err, you know? And actually they avoid them more when they see the mistakes, you know? Uh, but are there cases in which people actually judge humans harsher than they judge machines? Uh, and, and that in some way behave differently uh, than, than, than what we would expect from this literature. And we find a few examples, you know. Uh, so for instance, the first example here, it's a record label that tries to hire a songwriter or an artificial intelligence songwriter to write lyrics for famous musicians. So think of like a GPT-3 that runs songs, you know. Uh, the songwriter or the AI songwriter writes, you know, dozens of songs, you know, but a journalist later discovers that it has been plagiarizing lyrics from lesser known artists. Many artists are outraged when they learn about the news, you know? So here is a scenario of fairness, you know, that involves plagiarism. Uh, the next scenario is a scenario borrowed from the Moral Foundation questionnaire of Jonathan Hyde, but adapted to robots. So a family has a cleaner or robot cleaner in charge of cleaning their house. One day the family finds that the cleaner robot used an old national flag to clean the bathroom floor and then threw it away. And what we find here, for example, in the case of plagiarism, people put more harm on the action of the human, you know, a little bit more, but, you know, uh, people also see the action of the human as less moral, you know. In the case of the robot cleaner, people actually, you know, put quite a difference in terms of morality for the action of the human. So, so they find the action of the human to be much less moral. You know, uh, even though, you know, they judge the human worse in terms of morality, they like it less, or they find the human to be more harmful in their actions, they still want to replace the machine by the human, and they wouldn't want to replace a human by a machine. So that dimension, you know, it's humans uh, always beat machines, but in these other dimensions, you know, moral, harm, like, you know, higher, we are able to reverse the effect, we're able to find situations in which actually a human is judged worse than a machine. And these are not just a few exceptions. So let's look at chapter three that looks at algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias is a really hot topic today, you know, but uh, there are very few examples of people trying to understand how people judge, you know, algorithmic bias compared to humans that would have done the same mistake. Uh, so here, you know, we look at several examples. For example, a company that replaces the HR manager with a new manager or with an algorithm, 
uh, tasked with the screening candidates. Here we also have a lot of conditions, you know, uh, one is based on an unfair treatment where an audit reveals that the new manager or algorithm never selects Hispanic, African-American or Asian candidates and a fair treatment where an audit reveals that the new manager or algorithm produces a fair process for minority candidates. We wanted to do, you know, uh, ethnicity and gender, but honestly, uh, uh, it began to explode in the number of different groups that we needed to hire and uh, through Mechanical Turk to the point that actually we started to run out of people in Mechanical Turk that had not participated in any of our experiments, you know? So, so we only did these three conditions based on ethnicity, you know, uh, uh, in, in this case. Uh, and we do this for a number of different examples. So we do college admissions, we do policing, we do salary increases, and these are all the scenarios that trigger the moral dimension of, you know, fairness. And uh, since the results are similar across them, I'm just gonna look at uh, one set of examples. Um, so here we look at the unfair treatment, you know, of this HR scenario. And what we find is that people, once again, find the action of the human to be more harmful, not by a lot, you know, but, you know, in many cases, you know, it, this happens to be significant. They also find the action of the human to be, you know, less morally correct. And these differences are largely mediated by the fact that, you know, they don't see the action of the machine as intentional, but they do see the action of the human as very intentional in these cases. So if someone is involved in a, in a situation that, that it's unfair and it's a human, you know, people think that they're kind of like doing it you know, for a reason, you know, they're motivated to do it. If it's a machine, you know, they say, well, you know, is, is this something that was built into the machine or that the machine figured out by itself and it's kind of like trying to perpetuate? We sort of don't know. So people kind of like cluster around the middle, you know, uh, but nevertheless, you know, they do judge because of that difference in intention, the action of the human as less, you know, morally correct and so forth. Um, nevertheless, you know, they, they, they do still want to replace the machine, you know, by a human and not the human by a machine. Now, what about when the machine and the human gets it right? You know, when they, they produce an outcome that is better, that is more fair, you know? Uh, here we don't see big differences. So they don't take the machine for granted as much as they, as they did in the uh, scenario of the tsunami, you know? Uh, but they do give more intention to the human uh, they do want to replace the machine even when it gets it wrong. So a machine that produces a fair outcome in HR or in university admissions, you know, gets replaced, you know, by a human uh, even when it gets it right, you know. Uh, so, so people have like these reluctances to accept machines uh, or, or at least to want to keep them even when they get it right, you know, and they assign more responsibility to the human than to the machine. I'm going to skip chapter four, which is about, you know, privacy, but you can look at it in the book, you know, we discuss uh, several examples of, you know, differential privacy in the beginning of that chapter. And then we look at examples of privacy in schools, airports, you know, government surveillance and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to look at instead uh, chapter five, which looks at labor displacement, you know. Labor displacement is a bit of a different topic. It also triggers the moral dimension of fairness, but in this case, it's about, you know, people like losing the job or having the perception that they lost the job, you know, to a machine. So these are the scenarios of this kind. A trucking company is looking to lower costs by bringing in temporary foreign drivers or autonomous trucks. This change reduces the company's cost by 30%, but several local drivers lose their jobs. So it's a company looking kind of like to cut costs, you know, uh, in one a case they bring foreigners in that case they bring technology you know we do the same for a chain of luxury resort hotels you know who bring you know foreign foreigners to work on their uh, tiki bars in the pool or they use vending machines uh, a nuclear plant that has like an ai you know software or a school that is looking to hire foreign teachers or you know to have some sort of ai or robot teacher technology you know uh, and what we find is quite interesting because the effect, it's consistent, but the magnitude changes a lot across the different scenarios. So if we look at the truck driving scenario, this is a very blue collar profession, you know, it's kind of like a job that in, in, in some way, uh, like, like people seem to believe that, that it has to be protected because um, they're willing to ban foreigners, you know, that come to work as truck drivers 
but they're not necessarily willing to ban technology uh, with the same strength, you know? So they approve of the technology, they disapprove of the foreigns, they find the use of technology to be, you know, morally relatively okay, like in the middle, the, the use of foreigners, they find it morally more reprehensible, you know, the, the opinion that they have of the company goes down more, you know, when the company uses foreign, so people kind of like don't like the companies that would do that. They use technology, they, 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 they don't see that as, as, as bad in comparison, you know. Uh, they think that they would have done the same in a similar situation when we present this as a context of technology in this case, you know. And they also think that more people would approve of technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis foreigners. Now, when we move to the hotel, you know, we see the same pattern, but the differences are much smaller. You know, here we're talking about p values of 10 to the 9, 10 to the minus 11. Here we're talking about 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, you know, 10 to the minus 3. When we look at the nuclear plant, you know, here the differences, you know, they're very significant. So they're not very big differences. And this kind of like gradient sort of tells us that as, as we go up, you know, uh, into more and more, uh, let's say, knowledge intense sectors, you know, people tend to kind of like be more accepting uh, of foreigners in that context, but still they're more accepting of displacement based on technology, you know, which is interesting because there has been a lot of press on, you know, the fear of people being displaced by machines, but actually, you know, we find at least in this US sample, people are, you know, much more afraid or, or much more willing to condemn being displaced, you know, by foreigners. In the school example, we find no differences, but here, you know, we're having like a ceiling or floor effect, you know, the ratings are really low. So people don't want robot teachers and they don't want foreign teachers. That's a, an occupation that we find like a strong preference for people to protect domestically. Then we do the same with, you know, other type of service jobs that could be, you know, outsourced and offshore. So for example, we have a law firm, you know, that decides to open a branch in a low income country or hire a foreign contractor, or bring in foreign workers with temporary visas, or replace older workers with younger workers, or to buy an AI legal system. You know, We do the same for a software firm, a hospital looking to analyze CAT scans, a manufacturing company you know, that you know, might you know, teleoperate these robots. So, so this allows us to, to kind of like compare different you know, uh, forms you know, uh, of displacement by humans, offshoring, outsourcing, you know, foreigners coming into the country or, you know, replacing older by younger workers. And what we find again, similar to the, the case before, people react less strongly against, you know, machine displacements, you know, so they are likely to approve, you know, that change more when it's uh, the action of a machine or, you know, uh, they, they don't want to ban it as much as they would want to ban foreign workers or younger workers, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, we do find some differences in some examples based on the different forms of uh, displacement at the hand of humans. People tend to be very much against, you know, uh, bringing in foreign workers or replacing older workers by younger workers. They find that to be quite discriminatory. They're more accepting on offshoring and outsourcing. That could be explained kind of like by some sort of in-group bias. You know, if I'm working in a company and my company opens a branch in another country, that is still part of my company. They're still kind of like my guys in some way. Those foreigners that are coming in to take my job, they're not part of my same in-group. So offshoring tends to be, yeah, on average, the, the, the most accepted of the forms, followed by outsourcing. You know, still none of them, you know, uh, is able to uh, trump the idea of replacing humans uh, by a machine in all of these labor displacement scenarios. So now let's try to put all of these things together. We looked at a few scenarios, you know, we have many, many, many more in the book. Actually, we have so many that we have an appendix, you know, with like around 20 something scenarios that, that didn't make it to the chapters, which also have a lot of uh, interesting things to, to show. Uh, but what I wanna do here is now I'm gonna look at all of the scenarios together, you know? So instead of looking at, at one scenario or a group of scenarios at a time, I wanna start like looking at these moral functions that we talked at, uh, about before. First, I'm gonna do it using descriptive statistics. And I wanna do this because I don't wanna get caught up with any of kind of like the, the problems that we have when we use a statistic, which is, well, what are the assumptions of the model and the econometrics and all of that stuff, you know? 
I, at, at heart, you know, um, I'm a natural scientist and I, and I do believe on the idea of like, you know, like looking at nature, whether it is, you know, looking at data or looking, you know, at the waves in the ocean as a way to, to kind of like think about, you know, the world, you know. And after we look at these descriptive statistics, you know, uh, that are unfiltered, they don't use any model, you know, there's are just, you know, distributions and averages. I'm going to go into, you know, do a, a little bit of modeling, you know, and, and try to map these model functions to see if I can sort of formalize what I see on these descriptive statistics. Okay. So as, as I presented before, you know, we're going to use in this case a three-dimensional space where we have for each scenario, its level of perceived harm, intention, and wrongness. And we're going to then uh, assign each scenario to two dots one, you know, when that scenario was presented to people as the action of a human, the other one as the action of a machine. And we'll write these two dots with a line so we know, you know, which blue dots correspond to which red dots. Okay, so this is how this looks like, you know, uh, when we put, you know, all of the scenarios for which we have these three dimensions. You know? So the first thing that you see that these things fall kind of like on a plane, they're not everywhere. And that is actually something that is, is kind of intuitive. If you have something that has, let's say, a lot of intention and a lot of harm, definitely is going to be wrong. You know, there's no way that you're going to have a value of one in intention, a value of one in harm and zero wrongness, okay? So there are kind of like some forbidden corners, you know, that force, you know, all of these dots to fall in kind of like some sort of, you know, plane, you know? But it's hard to see things in 3D, so we're going to look at the faces of this cube one by one. So here we look at harm and intention. Okay? And what we see here is, is quite interesting. We see the blue dots, which represent you know, uh, people judging humans, you know, to be distributed high or low on intention compared to the red dots. You know? uh, so here on the top, you know, there's more intention assigned to the human than the machine. And here on the bottom, there's more intention assigned to the machine than to the human. You know? So what we're finding is that Basically, when people judge the action of humans, we tend to be quite bimodal in the way that we think about intention. You are either innocent or you are either, you know, uh, guilty and, and you, you should take the fall or the blame, you know. But when we think about machines, you know, we don't assign a lot of intention to them on one end of the spectrum, but we're so we're unwilling to forgive them on the other si side of the spectrum. So we have like, like completely different distributions. We, we look at the intention of humans using a bimodal distribution that, that clusters a, a, along the, the extremes. And the one of machines using a unimodal distribution that is more around kind of like this 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 value. Yeah? That's one difference that is purely descriptive. And next, we look at the wrongness intention plane. And as I explained before in this peanut butter scenario, you know, intention is, is a big amplifier of moral judgment. You know, so when the level of intention is low, the actions are not too wrong or too right, you know, uh, but in that uh, regime, you know, basically machines get the short end of the stick. Uh, people judge the actions of, you know, machines worse as the actions of humans, you know, even though, you know, these are actions that are basically accidents and that's why they're in this level of intention. Now, when we go to high levels of intention, you know, uh, here we see kind of like some important difference. You see kind of like these two clusters here and there. These are the uh, scenarios involving algorithmic bias. And here, you know, humans are seen as more intentional and more harmful or, or worse, sorry, more, more wrong. Uh, or they're also, you know, seen as more intentional doing something better, you know, because intention amplifies moral judgment, you know. But we do have some exceptions here. For example, you see this one here. You know, uh, here the machine is seen as more intentional doing worse. And this is an scenario of an extrajudicial killing, you know, because actually people tend to be really unforgiving of machines when that involved in physical harm, you know, which uh, we saw in some scenarios in the beginning, but there are many more scenarios in the book beyond the self-driving car and the tsunami that involve physical harm. And when we see scenarios involving harm, definitely, you know, people uh, tend to judge machines very strongly. Finally, we have the harm wrongness uh, plane. And here in the harm wrongness plane, you know, we see a strong correlation between harm and wrongness, but we also see some clusters, you know, at the low, low levels of harm, you know, machines basically also get the short end of the stick that are, that are considered as doing something worse, you know, even though it's not too bad, you know, and, and humans are, are seen as doing something better. 
Yeah. Uh, so can, can we formalize this? Like it looks like in a lot of like this, let's say scenarios that are not too bad or too intentional or too harmful, you know, people tend to like really be unforgiving to machines. So, so, so we tend to be kind of petty and not forget machines for like simple mistakes. So what I'm going to do that is now I'm going to formalize that using some econometrics. I'm going to try to predict the level W of wrongness of a scenario as a function of intention, harm, and interaction term and fixed effects, you know? So, you know, for, for those that are not familiar with the idea of fixed effects, fixed effects is just a vector that is one, you know, for each individual in our sample and zero for everyone else. So that allows us to control for any constant characteristic of an individual. So if the level of wrongness changes because some people are too judgy or some people, you know, judge everything too positively, doesn't matter if that's a constant factor the fixed effect takes care of it you know anything that doesn't vary you know in time you know uh, for an individual is going to be captured by the fixed effect you know so that is going to give us a relatively good model you know so we we introduce this model sequentially so here we have humans judging machines you know as a function of intention harm interaction term of intention and harm are constant of course when we have fixed effects there's no constant because everybody's getting their own constant you know and the, this final model that we have here with fixed effects is playing about 64 percent of the variance you know with relatively few you know uh, variables you know uh, but what we find here is that basically what really you know uh, matters here you know or the one that dominates it's harm you know when people are judging machines you know the perceived level of harm tends to explain a lot of the perceived level of wrongness, you know, and it followed by harm and intention, you know, this interaction term. Now, when we look at people judging people, you know, harm drops a lot, you know, and what really matters is the interaction term between harm and intention, you know, it, it, it is the lion's share of the explanation here. So we, we can look at this graphically, and this is how this looks graphically. This had like these planes now, you know, drawn graphically. So the red plane is people judging machines. And what we see in this red plane of people judging machines is that is relatively, you know, a constant around, along the intention dimension and it grows along the harm dimension. And it's also relatively flat. The one of people judging people, which is the blue plane, you know, has a curvature, you know, that you would see along this axis here. You know, I'm hoping that you see the mouse because I've been moving it a lot, you know, and it grows more along this diagonal, you know. So when people judge people, you know, basically what matters is the outcome and, and the judgment grows along that harm dimension. When people judge uh, uh, people, not machines, uh, the harm grows, sorry, the, 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 the judgment grows along this diagonal, you know, and uh, what that means, you know, is that you know basically you know people are judging uh, people in a way that uh, they care more about you know the interaction term between intention and harm and that generates kind of like a regime at the high levels of intention in which it is in this region where people are willing to judge people very hard harsher than machines but for most of the other uh, part of this moral space people are going to judge you know machines more harshly especially for accidental situations so something kind of like could be considered an accident when a human was involved and a machine was involved, I can bet money that the machine is gonna get uh, judged uh, much more severely. You know? So to summarize this, of course, there is more nuance than this, but I, I do like the idea of trying to summarize things in, in, in basic principles. And our question was, you know, if a human and machine makes the same mistake, do they get the same reaction? The answer is clearly not. These functions are not the same. And what we can say is that people judge humans by their intentions and machines by their outcomes. Uh, this is very simple, but it's actually profound. Uh, I'm not going to discuss chapter seven of the book, but in chapter seven of the book, I start exploring kind of like what this means, you know, uh, in terms of the way that we perceive organizations and we perceive the government, you know, because we do tend to assign intentions not only to humans and machines, but also, you know, to organizations at large. And whether we think of organizations as machine-like or human-like, you know, might change also, you know, the way that we engage with them and, 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 and how we think, you know, uh, the role on, on, and how, how we think about the role in society. 
So, you know, the book is, is a little bit longer than this. You know, I picked up like a few things here. So please do go ahead. The book is for free at judgingmachines.com. I had a huge battle that I had to win with the publisher, you know, uh, to, to be able to do this, you know, because I do want this to be accessible. So if you want to use it in a class, if you want to share it, if you want to screenshot something and send it to someone else, you know, think of this as a completely open source, you know, resource that, that you can use, you know, it's available in formats for, you know, um, desktop and mobile. I also want to thank uh, my collaborators and um, particularly Diana and Filipa, uh, both of them, you know, have PhDs in social psychologies. Uh, they are Portuguese scholars, you know, who are now, you know, working in, 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 in back in Portugal in, in, in universities and companies. And they did an amazing job at, you know, helping collect all of this data. Jordi, you know, is a roboticist who, you know, uh, helped kind of uh, understand some of the literature and, and the context, you know, in which this work was, was taking place. And Natalia, she, she works in marketing and, and helping the construction of, of some of these scenarios, you know. Uh, the book also includes the collaboration with, with great artists and designers. Uh, Gabriela Perez, you know, um, did all of the design of the book, which I think is, is great. And, and we also commissioned art from two original artists, Mauricio Salfate, who uh, drew like these things that look more like um, comics, you know. He's actually a professional comic uh, book artist. And Maria Venegas, who is an illustrator, you know, working on the film industry and the video game industry, who, who created this beautiful original art, you know, involving um, situations uh, that combine humans and machines. And, you know, there's more, feel free to get, you know, the book online uh, or to order a print copy from MIT Press. It's gonna be available on print starting February 2nd. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions.